Hey guys, it's Chris at Highland Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned the honor and privilege of your subscription. And of course, to everybody who's watching, if you enjoy or appreciate anything from this video, show your support by clicking that thumbs up button. So what I'm going to be doing in today's video is I'm going to be gluing the fretboard onto the neck of my six string multi-scale guitar build. Now it's a pretty simple process, but there's actually quite a bit that's involved and I'm gonna to try to explain it in as much detail as possible. So let me bring you in closer and we'll get started. Now before I glue the fretboard down to the neck, there is one other thing I need to do and that is to drill the holes for the tuners. It's better to do that now. And you're probably wondering, why didn't I do that? when I cut the neck out on my CNC machine. Well, if this had been a flat headstock, like a, like a Fender Stratocaster or Telecaster, then yes, I would have drilled the tuner holes at the same time that I was carving the neck with the CNC machine. However, this uh, headstock has an angle. It's about a 10 degree angle. And because of that, I can't drill the tuner holes with my CNC machine. My CNC machine is only a three axis CNC machine, so it moves in the X, Y, and Z axis, but I can't tilt the, the spindle, so I can't get the angle right to drill those holes. The only way I would be able to do that with a three-axis CNC machine is if I were to clamp the headstock down to the wasteboard of the CNC machine so that it's flat, and I would need a fixture to do that. A fixture that would not only allow me to clamp it down flat, but would also allow me to position it to where I could locate the spindle, home it, and then precisely drill the location of the holes. That's a lot of work. And in truth, it's easier just to walk this over to my drill press and drill the holes. But of course, to do that, I have to mark the position of the holes so that I will drill them in the correct location. And to do that, what I've done is I have printed out the headstock full size. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut it out, place this printout on top of the headstock, and then I'll use my center punch to mark the position of those holes. Okay, so I'm going to be using a 3 8 inch diameter brad point drill bit. And brad point drill bits are the best type of drill bits to use when drilling through wood because this point keeps the bit from wandering as you drill through the wood. And that's especially important when you're drilling really hard woods. So this is typically what I like to use. Also, the fishtail shape of the end of the bit also prevents the bit from tearing out chunks of wood on the other side. So as I'm drilling through the headstock, I can be reasonably assured that this type of bit isn't going to tear out chunks of wood as it passes through the, the other side of the headstock. However, I'm still gonna use a sacrificial backer board to reduce the potential for tear out. <laughs> Okay, so before I can glue the fretboard to the neck, I've got to make sure that both the gluing surfaces are absolutely flat. And the way I do this is I have a little fixture that I made years ago that consists of a couple of pieces 
of plywood that are glued together to make it really stiff. Uh, each plywood piece is, I think, three quarters of an inch thick, and it's uh, it's a high quality Baltic birch plywood. And then on the top of it, I glued down a piece. It was a strip of laminated floorboard because the backs of these boards are really flat. So I glued it backside up so I have a really flat surface. And then what I'll do is I will just proceed with sanding using a strip of, this is an 80 grit, I think it's 80 grit, uh, roll of sandpaper, it's like two and a half inches wide, and I clamp it down at both ends. And the clamps are also clamping the fixture to my workbench. So then all I have to do is sand like this until I get the surface really smooth. Now you could also put pencil lines on here. A lot of guys like to do that to gauge their progress. Uh, I typically don't worry with doing that. Okay, the next step is to install the truss rod. But before I do that, I want to make sure that the adjustment nut is in the neutral position. And then I want to check it with my precision straight edge to make sure it is absolutely straight and not bowing in any direction. Then all I have to do is install it into the slot. Oh, before I install this, there are a couple of things I should mention about the truss rod slot. When I routed the slot on my CNC machine, I used a quarter inch diameter two flute spiral upcut end mill. It's a flat end mill. And the bottom of the slot is flat. It's not a U shape. It doesn't match the U shape of the truss rod. Some folks think that it needs to match that shape, but it doesn't. There's no uh, performance or uh, feature gain whatsoever in having the bottom of the slot match the contour of the bottom of the truss rod. The truss rod is gonna work exactly the same way, no matter whether it's a U-shaped channel or just a flat bottom channel. So I don't bother with it because during my CNC carving process, I cut the slot first, then I immediately cut the uh, angled face of the headstock. And I wanna use the same bit so that I don't have to swap bits um, in between carving operations. It just takes extra time. So I just use a straight end mill since I'm going to use that for both cuts. And as a result, I don't have that U-shaped cut. Now when you install the truss rod, it's Im extremely important that the surface of the truss rod is flush with the surface the gluing surface of the neck where the fretboard will be glued down. If any part of this truss rod is sticking up out of that slot, when you go to clamp down the fretboard, it's going to cause the fretboard to bow over that section of the truss rod which is proud of the surface, and that'll change the radius of your fretboard. So you need to make sure that the truss rod is flush with the surface. If it's sticking up, one way that you can fix it quickly is to remove the truss rod and then take a quarter inch chisel. You gotta make sure it's sharp. And then you would simply insert it into the slot and then drag it its length using the end of the chisel to scrape the bottom of the slot. And you would do this in both directions so that you get both ends of the slot uh, deepened with that chisel. And then as you're working, you would have to periodically install the truss rod to make sure that it's flush with the surface. But then once you have it flush, you're good to go. Now, if by chance the slot was too deep and the truss rod was below the surface, I would recommend cutting a thin strip of wood that's equal to the width of the channel and deep enough to where when you install it, that wood, the surface of that wood, would be flush with the top. Uh, you don't want the, the truss rod to be below the surface because that f would form a gap. And when you glue the uh, fretboard on, the truss rod could rattle inside of that slot. Um, 
Now, this particular truss rod has a plastic coating on it. It's a shrink wrap coating. And it fits very snug into the slot. It's not going to move around from side to side. It's not going to rattle at all. But if the truss rod you're using doesn't have a coating like this, or if it's fitting loosely into that slot to where you, it's going to rattle, you can always wrap it up in some Teflon plumber's tape that you get at the hardware store. And you would just wrap it up and put enough wraps to where it would fit snug down into the channel and then you're good to go. When I designed this guitar, I decided that I was going to use a bone nut that would be about 3 16 of an inch thick or roughly 4.77 millimeters. And it's going to sit on a shelf at the front of the fretboard, kind of the same way that a nut sits on the neck of a Gibson Les Paul guitar. So knowing this, I'm able to position exactly where the fretboard will be glued down to the neck. So what I've done is I've drawn a line. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I've drawn a line across here and that represents where the angle headstock meets this flat surface area. And then I've set my digital calipers to 0.1875 inches and I simply will place that right, the lower jaw right on that line and then I will put a tick mark on each end, each side of the neck. Then what I can do is I'm going to take a piece of black electrical tape and I'm going to use that to connect those two tick marks that I just drew. Okay, so this, this area right here at this edge is where the nut's going to sit. This edge of the tape is where this edge of the fretboard needs to rest. So it will sit down on there like this. And I'm using black electrical tape because it's clearly visible. Now what I have to do is take a thin strip of masking tape. This is about three eighths of an inch wide. And I'm going to place this right over the truss rod because as I apply the glue to the surface of the wood, I don't want glue to get to run down into the or to cover the truss rod. However, getting glue in there isn't really going to affect its performance because it's wrapped up in that plastic. And if you have it wrapped up in Teflon, same thing, it's not going to affect it. It's just a good um, practice to cover that truss rod before you apply the glue. And then let me kind of walk you through how I'm going to glue this and then I'll actually do it. What I'll do is I'm going to use tight bond wood glue. Now I like to use tight bond wood glue because the other wood glues, the tight bond 2 and the tight bond 3, especially tight bond 3, dries really dark in color. So when you're gluing a maple fretboard to a maple neck, you can see a dark brown line that runs the length on both sides. That's the glue seam. But with this type of wood glue, the, the tight bond original, it, the, 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 the line is less noticeable, so I prefer to use that. So what I'll do is I'll just apply it, and then I'm going to use a silicone glue brush to spread it around and get it thoroughly, consistently spread across the surface. Then I'm going to use table salt, and I've talked about the table salt trick before. I use table salt, a couple of grains, at the nut, in the middle, and at the heel. And what that does is it prevents the fretboard from sliding around under clamping pressure because glue is really slippery. The grains of table salt will act like teeth and they'll dig into the wood of the neck as well as the back of the fretboard and grip the two together so that they won't slide. Now some folks have said, and, and I know that Type Bond has even said this as well, that when you put salt in glue it affects the chemical structure of the glue, the molecular structure and the glue won't perform the way it's supposed to. And I'm sure that's true if you were to put 
salt all across the entire surface. And if you're really concerned about it, you can use sand, fine sand as well. But I don't have sand available, so I just grab the salt shaker from my table and it works just fine. I've done hundreds and hundreds of guitars this way and I've never had a problem. And it's so much easier than tapping in little brad nails into the fret slots. Um, I've never done it that way and never will. So uh, I'm just going to use the salt method. All right, so what I'm going to do at this stage is to let that glue dry and cure. Now, typically, Type on Original, you can clamp it for 30 minutes to an hour, and that should be enough for the glue to set up, and then another few hours to let it fully cure. But I can let this sit for probably five to six hours and I should be fine at that point to remove the clamps. Now, I know some of you are going to have a conniption because of the glue squeeze out. And there's squeeze out on both sides. Don't worry about it. If you are tempted to grab a damp cloth and wipe away that squeeze out, what you're actually going to be doing is you're going to be diluting the glue with the dampness of the cloth and smearing it over the surface and it causes the glue to soak into the wood and it dries there and you can never get it out. That's a real problem when it comes time to apply whatever finish you plan to apply. If it's a stain or a dye or just a clear coat, it will not adhere uh, wherever there's wood glue. Um, it'll adhere but it won't look the same. You'll have a splotchy looking finish. So the best thing to do is just to let that glue squeeze out dry, then later on take a chisel and slice it off and it comes off nice and clean. Okay, it's been about 12 hours since I put the clamps on. Uh, I got busy with other things and didn't get a chance to come back and remove these earlier. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and take all the clamps off and we'll see how this turned out. Perfect. Now, some of you may be wondering about this uh, clamping call that I put on top of the fretboard before I clamped it. And it's basically just made out of two three quarter inch thick pieces of MDF that I glued together and I cut into the same taper as the taper on the fretboard. But it has ridges on either edge and those ridges focus the clamping pressure onto the edges of the fretboard. So hopefully when I remove all this glue, there will be no visible seam, or at, at least at, at the most, a barely visible seam. You can't always get rid of it completely, but you can minimize it pretty, pretty significantly. So let's head out to the shop and I'm going to remove all this glue squeeze out. The way that I like to remove this glue squeeze out is to use a file. And this specifically is called a Japanese Iwasaka file. 
And these are amazing files. I bought these years ago and they are one of the tools in my shop that I don't think I could live without. Now you could use a chisel or perhaps just a regular file, but a chisel is going to increase the risk of gouging the wood and a regular file isn't gonna be as effective at removing this glue squeeze out. But the way I use this is I will, the cutting action is going to be away from me. So in order to prevent damage to the edge of the fretboard, I'm gonna file towards the next shaft. So. Just like that. If I were to file the other way, coming off the fretboard, I could chip out this uh, edge here, which of course I don't want to do. So, now there still is a little bit of glue, but that'll be uh, removed when I start doing the final. Uh, 220 grit sanding so uh, but most of that uh, the drips have been sliced away with the file okay guys so the tuner holes are drilled the fretboard has now been glued into place and i think i'm going to end this episode at this stage what i'm going to be doing next uh, in a future episode is i'm going to drill the holes for the side dots and then I'll do some final sanding. I'll install the frets and then apply the finish. And hopefully I can do all of that in the next episode, but it may take a couple of episodes. Uh, it just depends on how long each, each stage takes. But uh, the neck is starting to look like a finished neck. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this video and got something out of it. If so, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, visit my eGuitar Plans website or my Highline Guitars merch store. And until the next episode, as always, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back for more future uh, guitar building videos.